Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video with Swag Boss. And in this video, as you guys can see, we are on the other side of my room, which as you guys know by now, that means we have ourselves another whiteboard video here on the channel. And I'm very, very excited about this particular whiteboard video here. In fact, I would go on record as to say that I think that this is going to be the most important whiteboard video I have made today. Because in this very, very special video, we are introducing what I call the swag scale. The swag scale. Now I've been working on this particular rating system for a long time. I have worked with top men from all over the comic book collecting hobby to come up with a rating, come up with a score, somewhat akin to the Morningstar score or on base percentage in the money ball sort of way for baseball that we could apply to comic books and give it a number to kind of ensure us how protected we might be if we want to invest in said comic book. So in this video, I'm going to take you guys through the various categories that come up with this number to give ourselves the rating of the swag scale. And then later on, I will pull some books and give you guys some examples of how to rate those books. And we will find out together what those scores are for those particular keys. Then you can take the swag scale and apply it to any book that you have in your collection. And so from here on out, I will be using the swag scale on the YouTube channel to rate certain books. This is highly scientific. There is no subjectivity in this. This is 100% foolproof. In fact, in the history of the swag scale, the Swagglehaas scale has predicted a thousand percent returns, guaranteed for every single comic book that is rated high on the swag scale. So in this video, we're gonna go through it. Might be a little bit of a long video, so you know, get yourself some water, get yourself a snack, and enjoy what I have to share with you here today. Of course, drop me a like, comment, subscribe here, and join the content, but let us get into the swag scale. Now, why did we make the swag scale? Well, as you guys know, ladies and gentlemen, out there, we got ourselves a lot of key collector Kevins, right? Key collector Kevins want to go to the moon. They want to get to the moon, but sometimes they're a little unsure of what books to buy. And they slide into Swagglehaus' DMs asking me questions about, oh, what, what, what do you think about this book? What do you think about this book? Well. I'm hoping that by the end of the swag scale video, they themselves will be armed with the tools to make their own decisions about what books they think might be good to invest in or buy. So let us go through the categories here. Now these categories are all rated out of five points, making the rating system out of a scale of 25 total points. So category one, let us start here. Category one, has to do with, of course, year. What year did this comic book come out? Now, as you guys can see, I have it broken down into certain windows of comic books being released. The first one here, 1937 to 1954. Now, why do we pick this particular window? Well, as we know, 1937 is around the time when comic books, as we know them today, started to take some kind of shape. And 1954 is roughly around the last year before the Comics Code of Authority ruined everyone in comic books. So if you are a book that came out in that particular window, you get a score of five points on the Swagglehaas scale. Now, if you are a book that came out between 1955 to 1962, you would yield yourself a score of four points. See how this works? 1963 to 1972, you will score three points. 1973 to 1976, you will score two points. And if you are a book that came out in 1977 to the present, you will score one point. Now, you might be wondering, why do these years have specific tiers and why do we have certain cutoffs where they are? Well, without getting too long and winded into it, of course, 1962, that was right around when the 10 cent mark started to turn over to 12 cents. So there is cause of rarity in that situation. 1972, of course, we're talking about the start of the Bronze Age, you know, the change when things like Overstreet came into play, where there was all of a sudden speculation in comic books. 1973 to 76, 76 is when, you know, we started to really get into the highly printed stuff. And of course, 1977 to present is where we are today. 
Now, that is year. So let us move on now to category two, which of course is supply. Kind of like year, although year doesn't always equal what the supply is. So we still have to take the numbers themselves into consideration. Now, there's a few caveats here in the supply. We are going off of what we generally know. And I, particularly on the swag scale, which is 100% foolproof, is only basing my numbers off of what the CGC census is telling us. Now, I realize that there might be more raw copies out there. And I realize that there might be certain books, specifically that of modern books, that are often as slabbed as other keys out there. You at home will have to use your own discretion, but I know that you are smart, right? I know that if you guys know that just because West Coast Avengers doesn't have 20,000 on the census, doesn't mean that we don't know that there aren't 20,000 copies out there, being that it was a Copper Age book. But let us go into supply here and use kind of reasoning when we think about this stuff. Now, if you are a book that has less than 300 CGC copies out there on the census, of course, on the scale of one to five, you will be getting a score of five. If you are a book that has less than 700 CGC copies out there on the census, you will get a score of four. If you are a book that has less than 4,000, you will get a score of three, less than 8,000, a score of two, and less than 20,000, a score of one. Yes, that is right. ASM 300 in this particular category gets zero points because it has a score above 20,000. Now, Let's go on now to category number three. Category number three is what I call popularity. Tier of character out there in the cultural space. How popular is this character? This category is where the MCU has an effect, right? We have five different categories to rate these comic books. And yes, movies and pop culture affects one of the categories, and that is character popularity. Now I have right here in parentheses, Ranker. What is Ranker? Ranker is a website that has a lot of different lists that people rank. I would use that if you are somebody who is unsure about a tier or a popularity of a certain character. I would use Ranker to check and see, hey, top 100 Marvel superheroes. What do the general masses think about the popularity? And you will find the results. But as we break it down here in these categories, what do we see? Well, if you are a top 20 hero, you will get a score of five points. Now in parentheses, you will notice for villains, we have top 10. So top 20 heroes, top 10 villains. As we all know, unfortunately, I love villains, but villains do not get the same level of respect in the values of their comic books. So we have to equate for that in our swag scale. Now, additionally, I have a plus one modifier. Plus one modifier. We will talk about this plus one mod modifier later on when we get to certain examples here. But just know that if you are a character who is not only in the top 20, but you are of that level of character that is so popular on the swag scale, I might give you a plus one. We're talking about Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, Darkhawk, characters like that. Now, if you are a top 40 character or your top 20 villain, you will get a score of four points. If you are a top 60 or top 30, a score of three, top 100, top 50, a score of two, top 150, top 100, a score of one. Now, you're also probably wondering, well, Swag, this is talking about first appearances of characters. What if this is a comic book that doesn't have a first appearance? What if it is a non-superhero comic book? Well, that is very, very simple. You will just take the scale and apply it to other books within the categories that they represent. For instance, if we're talking about a PCH book, a pre-code horror book, are you in the top 20 generally most popular pre-code horror books? Are you in the top 40? Are you in the top 60? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Takes a little bit of discretion, but you guys are smart. I know you will figure it out. And later on, when we do our examples, I will show you guys a pre-code horror book. Now, category four. This one is the most important, and there's going to be a lot of hurt feelings in this category. I certainly know that later on when I show you guys some examples, I will have to swallow some of my pride and, you know, eat my words. But in category four, we are talking about historical demand. Historical demand, a very, very imp important category and almost the category that counterbalances the popularity category. 
This is the one where, besides the MCU, besides all of this pop cultural stuff, when it comes down to pure holders, pure collectors, what has been the historical demand for these characters, for these books? Here we are in these five different categories. Does everybody want this book? If everybody wants this book, well, they get five points. Do most people want this book? Well, if most people want it, they get four points. Do many people want this book? Three points. Do some people want this book? Two points. And do few people want this book? One point. Now, again, there is a little bit of interpretation that you are going to have to do when you are rating this stuff right here. But again, like I say, I know you guys can figure it out. I know you guys are very, very clever and you guys have a reasonable understanding of historically speaking, which characters and which books have been popular. Now, the final category and the most complicated probably needs some of the most explanation is category five here, which I am referring to as aesthetics. Now, category five is rated in a slightly different way. There are five key aesthetics that I think are important to distribute values for this particular category. We have the five C's. We have cover, coolness, comic series, credits, and controversy. All right, now this is gonna be very, very clear when I get to the examples, but let me try to explain it for now. In order to get five points in the aesthetics category, you need to have all five of these things. You need to check all five of these boxes, right? So it's a scale of five, four, three, two, and one, just like these other ones, but you must have all of these things. So let us break down each of these subcategories and we'll go through it in detail when we get to the examples. Cover, is the cover of your book reflective of what is significant about it? For instance, let's say you have any book that is the first appearance of a character. Does that cover have that character on it? If it does, you get one point. Coolness, is the cover cool? Now it might have the character on the cover, but does that character actually look cool on the cover? Let's think about Amazing Spider-Man number four. Sorry, Sandman fans, but that is an example of a book where the character is on the cover, but a lot of people, historically speaking, do not think it is a cool cover. Now, if it's a cool cover, you get a point. If it is not a cool cover, you would lose a point right there. Comic series. Now, this is very, very important. Comic series. Is this book in a title that, historically speaking, people like to collect? So beyond that, of the character that it has the first appearance of, are there gonna be other people that need this book in their collection? I'm thinking about Amazing Spider-Man as a series. If you are a character who has a first appearance in that series, not only are you protected with being a significant book because it is the first appearance of that character, you are also protected because there are just a lot of Amazing Spider-Man collectors, so there's always gonna be that much more demand. If you are in a series that is significant, you will get another point. Credits, is this book done by artists or writers that people historically like to collect? I'm thinking about Stan Lee. I'm thinking about Todd McFarlane. Just the fact that the book is done by credited writers and artists gives it another point. So if you are of that ilk, you will get another point. And lastly, controversy. Is there any controversy surrounding this book? Now, if it does have controversy, you will not get a point. If it doesn't have controversy, you will get a point. Now, what do I mean by controversy? Well, the most classic example is Hulk 180 and Hulk 181. So in this particular category, it might, they might be on the cover, 181, Wolverine. It might be a very cool cover. It might be Incredible Hulk, which people like to collect. It might be done by, you know, Herb Trimp, which is a great artist that people like to, uh, you know, appreciate. But controversy. There's gonna be split values. People are gonna buy 180, people are gonna buy 181. Are there other factors that are going to hurt the value? I wanna know that if I buy this book, this is the book to own. I want to know that this is the first appearance. There is no other books. This is the one where all of the money goes. That is controversy. So if you have all five of those things, you get five, four, three, two, one, et cetera, et cetera. Now, again, as we add up all five categories, 
Five out of five in each one of them, that is a rating score of 25 of 25. So let's kind of break it down right here. 26, now you're probably wondering, how could you possibly get a 26 out of 25? Well, we have this plus one modifier, which again, I will be explaining that soon. But if you do get a 26, you will get a gold star. If you're between 21 to 25, you are a blue chip. If you are 19 to 20, you are a certified key. If you are 17 to 18, you are low risk. If you are 16, you have some risk. If you are 15, I call you speculative. If you are 14 to 10, I call you highly speculative. And if you are nine to zero, unfortunately, you are not investable. All right. So now that we understand these categories on the swag scale, let's go through a few examples of books so that we can understand how these ratings come into play. Now, luckily for you guys, I happen to have all of the biggest and best keys out there in the market. So I can show you guys not only the low ends of the scale, but certainly the high ends of the scale. And luckily for you guys, for the very first time, I'm sharing you guys with you guys my comic, Action Comics number one. This is the copy that I have, the most valuable comic book in all of the market. Of course, you guys know that this is the very first appearance of Superman. So let us kind of break down Action Comics number one here, take us through the scale, and in example number one, let's see if we can come up with the score. So what year did Action Comics number one come out? Of course, it came out in 1938. So we know that it gets a score of five points right there. Now, we go to supply. How many copies are on the CGC census? Well, this is something that you guys are gonna have to do your own research on, but generally speaking, if you guys know, you would know that it is less than 300. Therefore, it is going to get another score of five points. Now we go over here to popularity. Is Superman a top 20 superhero? Well, I think it goes without being said that Superman is obviously a top 20 superhero. In fact, he is so popular he gets the plus one modifier on my scale. He is not only a top 20 superhero, he is a top five superhero, he is a top three superhero. In fact, you might even call him the top superhero. So he gets a six out of five on the category three of popularity. Historical demand. Does everybody want Action Comics 1? Do most people want Action Comics 1? Do many people? Some people? few people? Well, I think it is pretty obvious that if you gave anyone the opportunity to have Action 1 in their collection, they would 100% take it. So it's very obvious that everybody would want this book. Now, category five, let us talk about this. Is what is important about the book reflected on the cover? Well, it is the first appearance of Superman and Superman is on the cover, so we're good. Is the cover cool? Come on, he is rescuing people from a crashing car. We all know that that cover is not only cool, it is often homage. Of course, that checks that box. Is it from a notable comic series? Action Comics number one, legendary series, of course. Credits, Siegel and Schuster, legendary creator team. Of course, credits is good. Controversy, no controversy. That is Superman's first appearance. That is the book to get. I know that there is Superman one that people spend money on, but Action Comics one, as we all know, guys, is the Superman key to own. So therefore it gets five points. We total that up. What does that equal? 26. As you guys can see, Action Comics number one is a gold star on the swag scale. It is the creme de la creme, the number one book to own in your collection. And I am happy to have a copy. All right, let's go on now to another big boy book. One that I've never shared with you guys before, but this is my copy of Batman number one. You guys would know this to be the very, very first issue of the Batman series, also the first appearance of the Joker. Now, let us go through this book and see how this rates on the swag scale. When did this book come out? In between 37 and 54, yes it did. So it gets five points. Oh, we gotta use the green here, because green is good. Less than 300 supply? Well, if you guys know, you know. And yes, in fact, it has less than 300 supply. Top 20 hero or top 10 villain? Well, the Joker, I would definitely call a top 10 villain. So he might actually get this plus one modifier because he is that popular. We'll see though, but for now, we're gonna give him a five with a potential plus one. Would everyone want this book? Yes, I think it goes without being said that everybody would want this book. 
is what is reflected in terms of what is important about the book reflected on the cover? Well, actually, not necessarily. The Joker is not on the cover. So all of a sudden, we have a little flaw in this so far perfect book right here. So I would not give this a point. Is the cover still cool though? Well, of course, it is an amazing cover, off an homage with Batman and Robin swinging. So that's one point. Is it in a comic series? Batman, obviously. Finger and Kane credits, obviously. Great controversy. Well, it is the first appearance of the Joker. That is where it is. You could make a little bit of an argument that there is some controversy with you know the in-story side of it. So you, if you were really harsh, you could dock this book another point right here. So you may want to walk out with a three rating, but I'm going to give it a four simply due to the fact that he's not on the cover. What do we add this to be? Well, this of course is going to be a rating of 24. And then if we wanted to give it the plus one modifier, we could do that or we could keep it to 24, but no matter how you slice it, this falls in the 21 to 25 category, which makes it a blue chip key. If you ask me. All right, let's go on now to another interesting book, another grail that I have in my collection. Of course, we have to rate Amazing Fantasy 15 right here. The first appearance of Spider-Man. Now, this is a Silver Age book. So let us find out how the ratings start to change once you get into the Silver Age versus the Golden Age right here. And let us go through the swag scale together. All right. What year did this book come out? Well, you guys remember that it came out in 1962, just in that cutoff year window to give it Four points on the swag scale. Now, category two, supply. How many copies are there? Well, there isn't less than 300. There's not less than 700. We're talking about less than 4,000. That's kind of where this book rates on the scale. So now it gets a number of three right here. Let's go to category three, popularity. He is Spider-Man, of course, a top 20 bit superhero, certainly a top five, certainly a top three, maybe top one, definitely qualifies with the modifier if you ask me. So I will give him a five plus one. Category four, historical demand. Would everybody want this book? I think that goes without being said. Of course, everybody would want that book. Is what is important about the book reflected on the cover? Yes, absolutely. Is the cover cool? It's iconic. Is it a comic series that is notable? Mm, you could make the argument that Amazing Fantasy isn't really that notable, although the book itself is so notable that Amazing Fantasy is also notable. So in my personal opinion, I'm going to check that box. Credits, of course, Stan Lee and Ditko. Controversy, no controversy. This is the book to own for Spider-Man. We will give him another five right there, and we will add that up. Five, 10, 15, plus four is 19, plus that is 22, plus a potential plus one modifier that would make this book either a 22 or a 23 on the swag scale. Again, still putting it in the blue chip category. Now, not as safe of an investment, generally speaking, as say Batman 1 or Action Comics 1, but still a very, very safe book to buy. All right, let's move on now to example number four. Of course, my copy of Incredible Hulk number one right here, the amazing, amazing, first appearance of the Incredible Hulk. And let's talk about some of the interesting ways to take a look at that one and rate that book right there. So first things first, what year did it come out? Like Amazing Fantasy 15 came out in 1962. We will give this four points. What is the supply for this particular book? Well, it is a lower supply, but not quite at the 700 level. So we're going to give it the less than 4,000 supply, which gives it a rating of three. Is Hulk a top 20 superhero? Absolutely. He is a top 20 superhero. Does he get a plus one modifier? I would not say that he does. I think the plus one modifier is for a very, very select group of superheroes and villains, and I would not give Hulk that plus one modifier. Historical demand, would everyone want this book or would most people want this book? Well, I think generally speaking, everybody would want this book. Although if you're playing at home, you may think that most people would want it. Maybe it is not an everyone book. I don't know. My personal opinion, I still think that this hits the everyone category. Now category five is a little bit interesting is what is important about the book, the first appearance of Hulk, reflected on the cover? Yes, in fact, he is on the cover. Is the cover cool? Absolutely. 
is it in a comic series that people like to collect? Incredible Hulk. I think that that definitely is the case. Are the credits there? Yep, Stanley and Jack Kirby. Controversy. Is there any controversy with this book? Well, on the one hand, you might say that, no, this is the first appearance of the character, but here's where the swag scale gets a little bit interesting. Hulk is not green on the cover. He doesn't get green until issue number two. So in my personal opinion, that hurts this book ever so slightly. So I would say some controversy there because there are people who are going to want to put money into Incredible Hulk number two, and that money is left out of Incredible Hulk number one, simply due to the fact that people recognize Incredible Hulk number two as also a key because of the fact that he is green. So I would say that there is a slight controversy in his first appearance right there. So let us go through and total up these numbers on our screen. Five, 10, 18, 19, 20, 21. Incredible Hulk number one gets a score of 21 on the Swagahaw scale, just keeping it in the blue chip investable category. All right, next book we gotta talk about right here is one that is very, very interesting. And this is where the scale starts to kind of apply some different results to interesting books out there in the market. We have to talk about Tales to Astonish number 13. Of course, you guys know this book, the very, very first appearance of the character known as Groot. And this one is very interesting to talk about because it finds itself in a lot of different windows that we haven't discussed just yet. Now, let's talk about the year in which this book came out. I can't remember off the top of my head. It's a long day, it's a long video, uh, but I do know that it came out before 1962 and it came out after 1955. So we will give this book a four on the year scale. Now let's talk about supply. This one is also very interesting. This is in that era of postcode monsters. So there's less books out there in the market than that of the superhero stuff but not quite as few as some of that golden age stuff. This is one of those instances where we're talking about a supply around the less than 700 category, which gives this book a score of four on the supply. Now let's talk about character popularity. This is an interesting one because Groot, I would make the argument, is now a top 20 superhero. He is that notable in pop culture. He has felt the effects of the MCU boosting him up. There are that many kids that love this character. So he is now in that top 20. So his popularity score or MCU score boosts him all the way up to five points right there. Now let's talk about category four, historical demand. Now, if you guys remember before the MCU, this was a book that nobody cared about. This is a book that nobody even knew existed. This is a character that nobody even knew came from Tales to Astonish. So in the historical demand of this book, where would we put this one? Well, certainly not everyone, definitely not most, probably not many, maybe some. In fact, I'm gonna be a little more harsh and I'm gonna say before the movies, I would say very few people have ever wanted this book. So that one gets a score of one for me because Although it's a cool book that people would like to have, outside of the MCU aspect, historically speaking, do a lot of people want this thing? I don't really know. So it gets a one on the swag scale. Now let's go to category five here. Is what is important about the book reflected on the cover? Well, absolutely. There we see Groot right there. Is the cover cool? Now cool, I realize is very, very subjective, but generally speaking, I would still say it is a cool cover. Is it from a comic series that people historically collect? Well. I think Tales to Astonish is a very cool series, although there's not a lot of people that historically speaking would say, oh, I need to finish my Tales to Astonish run. They might be out there, but generally speaking, it's a little bit hard. It depends on how you want to play at home. If you want to be a little more harsh or you want to be a little more generous, you can decide if it should get a point in that category. Credits, of course, it is still done by Legendary Kirby. And controversy right there, Nope, there is no controversy. That is the first appearance of the character. That is the one to get if you are a fan of Groot. So depending on how you feel, I think that this one scores a four. So let's add this up. Four, eight, 12, 17, 18, right? I think if I did my math right, that gets an 18 on the swag scale, putting it in the, what I would call the low risk category. A book that generally speaking, if you buy it, 
There's not gonna to be too many paper-handed individuals that are able to undercut you, simply due to the fact that the year and the supply make it a hard book to find. But again, historical demand, how many people are really gonna be looking for it at any given time? Although the character is very popular, hard to really say, but generally speaking, if you buy the book, probably gonna be pretty low risk overall. All right, let's go on now to the next book that we should talk about right here, which is of course, X-Men number one. Now I have to apologize that my copy is not as pristine as the other copies I have over here. So you're gonna have to just bear with me and realize that we're gonna have to use this as the example for now for you guys to go with me on this journey to rate X-Men number one. Now, this one is very, very interesting because it starts to buck the trend of some of the other Silver Age stuff. Let's talk about the year that this book came out. This is a book that came out in 1963. What do we know about books that came out in 63 through say 69, all the way to 70 in this time frame of Silver Age books? Well, generally speaking, they're a little more volatile. Historically speaking, they haven't performed as far as returns in the same way that the 62 Silver Age books have done very effectively. So for X-Men number one in 1963, that gives it a score of three points right there. Supply, now this is one is very interesting. This is a book that actually has more than 4,000 supply. X-Men number one, a great book, one of the best Silver Age books, but unfortunately for it, it only gets a score of two in the supply simply due to the fact that it is above 4,000. So that hurts the investability of the book. Now, top 20 popularity category goes without being said, whoever you wanna pick for this, Professor X, Magneto, Cyclops, doesn't matter, all of them combined, easily a top 20 superhero, a top 10 villain. Maybe if you really wanted to give it a modifier, we could give it a modifier. We'll put that one to the side for now. Who would want this in their collection? Well, I would make the argument that everyone would want X-Men number one in their collection. Historically speaking, they are one of the most popular teams, characters in all of comic book collecting. Is what is important about the book reflected on the cover? Absolutely. Is the cover cool? In my opinion, it is. Is it from a comic series that people like to collect? X-Men, of course. Are the credits there? Stan Lee, obviously. Is there a controversy? Mm, I mean, maybe you could say, well, it's not the X-Men team like Giant Size X-Men, et cetera, et cetera. But in this particular case, I would say if you need Cyclops, Magneto, Professor X, that's the only place to go. So this one gets a five out of five for me. Of course, let us add it up here on the scale. Five, 10, 15, plus another five is 20, which puts it in the certified key category, which again, if we wanna give it the plus one popularity modifier, we could lift it up to the 21 score of blue chip. But generally speaking, you see that this one is on the cusp of blue chip certified key. And I think it hurts it simply due to the fact that the supply thing is the thing that's going to prevent it from being as investable as some of those other books like AF15 and Incredible Hulk number one. All right, I know it's been a very, very long video, but I have a few more examples I'd like to do for you guys so that you at home could apply the swag scale to any book you have out there. So let us go through the rest of these examples. Thank you for bearing with me, but it is important to show you guys this so that you can get a good understanding of all of the variables that come into play on the swag scale. Now, the next book we have to talk about is this one right here, Avengers number eight. Obviously a very, very hot book, a very popular one that features the first appearance of Kang the Conqueror. Now, of course, where, oh, all right. I'm gonna have to roll with it. All right, first appearance of Kang the Conqueror, Avengers number eight. Let's talk about this one. And I'll show you guys that in the swag scale, there's maybe a little more risk to a book like this. Now, category one here, what year did this come out? Well, it came out in 1964. So this one's gonna get a three on that scale. Supply here, less than 4,000, still fits that less than 4,000 description. Popularity, top villain, top superhero. Now this one is very, very interesting. Do we think that Kang is a top 10 villain? I would say probably not. Do we think Kang is a top 20 villain? Maybe he's starting to knock on the door, you know, and maybe when it's all said and done in the MCU, he gets himself in the top 20 villain category. But I'm thinking that right now, Kang is probably more of a top 30 villain. So he gets a three for me on the popularity scale although that may change in a few years time. Historical demand. Now, this one is also very interesting. You guys know that I am a big fan of Kang the Conqueror, but 
I have to be a little bit honest with myself and think about in the historical performance of this book, have there been a lot of people that wanted to collect this thing? Well, does everybody want this book? Certainly not. Do most people want this book? Mm, I don't know. Maybe now most people want it, but historically speaking, that wasn't always the case. Do many people want this book? Did many people want it? I don't even know if many people want it. I would just say that this is probably a book that falls in the some category of historically speaking, some people wanted to have this book in their collection. All right, let's talk about the aesthetics here. Now, is what is important about this book reflected on the cover? Yes, uh, Kang the Conqueror is on the cover. Is the cover cool? Well, you know, again, cool is subjective, but generally speaking, I would say that it is cool. Is it in a series that people like to collect? I mean, I know that Avengers is not ASM, but generally speaking, people do collect Avengers, myself included. Are the credits there? Of course, Stanley. Is it a controversy? Now, this one, depending on how you're feeling, could sway things a little bit because controversy is, this is the first appearance of Kang the Conqueror, yet there's also Rama Tut, and there's also, you know, other characters like that, Amortis, is the value of this thing going to be split because other people want to collect those things? I think that there is something that we have to consider, and especially if we're feeling kind of conservative, unless we think that this is the Kang book to own. So I would be willing to say that this book either gets a four or a five overall. And I think that that's something that you guys have to decide at home, but let us add this up together. Of course, one, two, three, six, nine, 10, 11, plus another four or another five. So this one would either be a four, a 15 or a 16 on the scale. And I would kind of call this in the some risk or speculative category. Now, again, it's all gonna have to do with how Kang performs if he is able to elevate himself to a top 20 villain or a top 10 villain in the MCU, then that might boost the score a little bit. But for right now, I would call this Kang book in that 15 to 16 range. Okay, next example right here we have to talk about is a book that you guys are very, very familiar with, but of course we're talking about Silver Surfer number four, the great John Buscema cover. And the reason I want to take you guys through the swag scale with this particular book is simply due to the fact that this is one that doesn't have a first appearance. It is only popular simply due to the fact that the cover itself is what makes it popular. But I still think that we can apply the swag scale to this book, and I will talk you through how I think I'm gonna do that. So let's talk about the year that this book came out, 1963 to 72. That makes it a three on the scale. Of course, this book came out in 1969. Supply here, now there's actually more than 4,000 copies of this one on the census. Of course, as we start to get later on in the years, 1969, there are more books available out there. So I get this one at the less than 8,000 range and that gives this book a score of two, which definitely kind of hurts it. Now, popularity. This one is a little bit hard to determine. You're gonna have to use your own judgment here, but generally speaking, would we call this a top 20 collector's cover? Meaning of just the great covers that people like to buy just for cover reasons. Is this in the top 20? Yeah, I actually think that this is. I think most people describe this book as one of the top Silver Age covers to own. So I would give this one a five when applying the popularity factor to it. Historical demand. Does everyone want this book? Mm, it's pretty close. A lot of people would want it. Do most people want this book? I would say that that's probably more accurate. While I don't think that everyone would want it, I would say that most comic collectors would want to have a copy of that book in their collection. Now, is what is cool about this book reflected on the cover? Well, the cover itself is what is important about the book. Therefore, I would give it a benefit or I would give it a point in that situation. Is the cover cool? Absolutely. Is it from a comic series that people typically like to collect? Yeah, Silver Surfer, I think so. Are the credits there? John Buscema, absolutely. Controversy, well, this is where I'm gonna to have to dock it. It is not a first appearance. There is nothing significant about the book other than the fact that it is just a cool cover. So for me, aesthetics, I'm giving this one a four out of five due to the controversy factor. So let us add it together. We have five points right here, plus another five is 10, plus four plus four is 18. I put this one in the low risk investable category, simply due to the fact that it is a classic John Buscema cover. Now, 
let us talk about the next book that we should discuss right here, which is a pre-code horror book, as you guys know, one that is recently added to the PC. And this, of course, is the Graveyard Feldstein cover. And I think that the swag scale can still apply to PCH books or other books that do not have first appearances. So let us go through it here together. First things first, we gotta talk about the year. Of course, this is the book that came out in the early 50s. So this one gets a five out of five in the year release. Supply here, less than 300. That is very good for this book. I think it is slightly higher on the PCH side of things, but at the same time, still less than 300. Category three here, popularity. In the scale of PCH books, where does this one rank? Is it in the top 20? I don't know if it's in the top 20. Is it in the top 40? Mm, I don't know if it's in the top 40 either. Is it in the top 60? Maybe, depending on the scale, kind of hard to determine this. But for now, let's say that this book is either in the top 60 or top 100 PCH books, but let us give it a three on the scale for now. Now, category four, historical demand. This one is very, very interesting. Does everyone want this book? Certainly not. Do most people want this book? I don't think most people want it either. PCH, although very cool, although very popular, is not for everybody. Do many people want this book? I'm not even gonna say that many people would want it. I think that this is more of a some category. Now, I do realize that a lot of PCH collectors would want this book, but PCH collectors in the grand scheme of comic book collectors is also a very small portion. So I would say that some comic collectors in general would want this book in their collection. Now, let's talk about the cover. Is what is significant about the book reflected on the cover? Well, yes it is because the cover itself is what people like. Is the cover cool? In my opinion it is. Is it from a comic series that is significant? Tales from the Crypt, absolutely. Are the credits there? Al Feldstein. Is there any controversy surrounding this book? Well. I would say that, you know, again, you have to use your own subjectivity here, but I do think that there is some controversy with this one in so much as once we get to the next issue and the issue after that, we get these similar covers where there's always kind of the same guy getting pulled into a graveyard or trapped by some kind of zombie, and that kind of diffuses the value. There are a lot of options if you are somebody who wants a Feldstein sort of cover like this, and I think that that disperses a lot of the value of this book. So this one rates a four out of five for me on the swag scale. Let us add it together. Five, 10, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. That makes this a score of 19. Although again, you know, if we wanted to be a little more stingy on this one, we could have called it a top 100. That would have maybe gave it a two in this category. And that would have given it maybe a score of 18. So between 18 or 19, as you can see, this is in a category where we're talking about kind of a key, maybe low risk, right there on the swag scale. Now, let us finish out the swag scale with the most important book that we have to talk about here. And that, of course, is Dark Hawk number one, the most investable book that there is out there in the market, the most important book to talk about. Now, let us go through the scale here and see how Dark Hawk number one is easily going to top the charts right here. Now, category one, what year did this book come out? Well, it came out in 1991. So we know that this one gets a, gets a score of one. Okay, no big deal. Now, category two here, supply. Where's the supply for this book? Well, on the CGC census currently, it is less than 4,000 because the CGC census says it's around the 3,800 census mark. But we have to use our own reasoning here. Do we think that this is a book that could have 20,000 copies out there? Probably, right? I mean, it was Dark Hawk number one. He was that popular in the 90s. So this book gets a, another one here in the supply side. It's okay, we're gonna make up for it in popularity. Now, category three, popularity ranker here. Is Dark Hawk a top 20 superhero? No. Is Dark Hawk a top 40 superhero? No. Is he a top 60 superhero? No. Is he a top 100 superhero? Maybe. Maybe. All right, let's give him a top 100, right? Let's give him a top 100. Maybe he's 99. 99, right? So 99 popularity. Now, category four, historical demand. Does everyone want this book? Obviously. Okay, no. Do most people want this book? No. Do many people want this book? I think that that is fair. Jokes aside, I think many people want this book or some people want this book. 
but I'm feeling a little more generous towards Dark, Ho Dark Hawk right here. Now let's talk about category five is what is cool about the book reflected on the cover. Absolutely. Is the cover cool? In my opinion, it is. Is it from a comic series that people like to collect? Uh, next one. Is it by artists and writers that people historically like to collect as well? Uh, I love Finger Off the Manly, but I don't think we can say that. Is there controversy around this book? Um, well, I mean, there is that Marvel Age where he's technically on the cover, but that's, I guess that's controversy. So we're getting two out of five right there. So if we add it together for Darkhawk, we see that it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine points on the swag scale, making this book a not investable. Not invest. Hey, that, that's bullshit. That is bullshit. Well, as you guys can see, the swag scale is complete bullshit. It is not accurate at all. Obviously, a scale that would rank Dark Hawk as not investable is nothing that you guys should be paying attention to. So I guess if you made it to this point in the video, uh, you've wasted your time uh, analyzing these swag scale books right here. But I guess it was worth doing the exercise regardless. Anyways, that's all I got for this video. That was the swag scale. Let me know what you guys think. What books do you guys rate on your scale using the swag scale? Like, comment, subscribe. See you in the next one.